we planted a birch tree about 12 years ago at my parents' house, a paper birch. And these trees have this long adolescence, which is the period where it sheds its bark. It is a long change for a little tree. Change can mean different, right? Changing paths and majors and changing jobs or moving. It is putting something down and picking something up. It is the babies I held so tenderly in my arms who are not babies anymore, but fascinating people with interests and stories to tell. They're always changing. Change implies before and after. The charred remains after a wildfire, the empty, declining business districts of small-town America. Change means loss and grief. Change assumes a beginning and an end. Change can leave a hole for a long time a reminder of what was. But change can also be a planting, a plowing, a scattering of seeds, a long wait for something new to grow. Change can be the heart open, which knows what was before and what has gone and has hope for what yet may be, life and death, and life again. Today's gospel story takes place in the middle of Mark's story. Eight chapters down, eight chapters to go. Of course, the chapter numbers were a later addition, but there are other markers that this is, in fact, the middle of the gospel. The geography is one example. Six days ago, Jesus and the disciples were in Caesarea Philippi, as far north as Mark's gospel will take us. And the next time Mark tells us where they are, it's Galilee, and then Capernaum, and then Judea, and then the area beyond the Jordan, and Jericho, Bethany, and finally Jerusalem, each location further south than the one before as Jesus adjusts his location settings. There's also this indicator of, of time, which is a rare thing for Mark. In Mark's gospel, he notes that things have changed, time has gone by because of these geography changes, as much the, as we see in that north to south journey. The only other time that Mark's gospel counts time like this is when Jesus is in the wilderness for 40 days and the three times he predicts what happens uh, between his death and resurrection. It is in this back and forth, though, the six days before and six days after, that boomerang of Jesus' out and back journey that suggests that things are about to change in this story. We have come at, out as far as we will go, and it's time to find the way back. And the way back is the way of the cross. That's what Jesus told them six days ago. It's the way of the cross. Six days before he was transfigured, Jesus turned to his disciples and said, Who do people, who, who do you say that I am? And that knucklehead Peter actually got it right for once. He called Jesus the Messiah. But when Jesus told them what it meant that to be the son of man or the, the child of humanity was to suffer and be rejected, to die and to rise, when Jesus told them of the changes that he would undergo, Peter got it dead wrong as usual, and he rebuked Jesus, and Jesus in turn rebukes him. And maybe that changed their relationship a little bit. But nevertheless, Jesus takes Peter along with James and John up the mountain. And this is what Peter hears. A voice from heaven saying, this is my child. Listen to him. This is the story where the disciples and, and we are prepared to encounter the heart-rending change that is a hallmark of life itself. To prepare, listen to him. 
Listen to him about the cross. Listen to him about what it means to be a Messiah, about how we will be called to pick up our crosses, about how we will all be changed, about how every end truly is tragedy, at least in part, that every end has its requisite sorrow. Listen to him about how to open your heart in spite of that. Listen to him about how to risk and be vulnerable and to love even in the face of change and loss and death. Transfiguration is our changed hearts, open to what might come after this life and this death, this joy and this sorrow. Transfiguration is an open heart ready to be filled Transfiguration is the heart sent out with a simple command. Listen. But to whom? Who, who do we listen to? And, and if Jesus says that to be the child of humanity is to suffer and die and rise, then we know that Jesus is found in the sorrows and the suffering of the world, in, in, the, in the sorrows and the sorrowing and the suffering and the ones who suffer. And so when that voice of heaven breaks open to say, this is my child, we are wise to hear its reverberations today. This is my child. This is my child in a refugee camp. And this is my child addicted to drugs. And this is my child who cannot trust their reality. This is my child grieving. This is my child hungry. This is my child dying on a city sidewalk. And this is my child in the crater left by a missile. And this is the child made to listen to the most hateful thing about themselves. And this one, and this one, and this one, my child. When I came back from the border this fall, I wondered, and a lot of folks asked me, like, what are we going to do about this? What are we supposed to do about this? And I still don't know. <laughs> I can only listen. Because you see, the border isn't just the Rio Grande, but it's here in Bloomington. It's in southern Indiana. There are folks here who need to be heard as they tell the truth about how things are changing in their home, about cartels and climate change and unending stretches of just no, no jobs, no opportunity, no change for the better. I don't know what to do about this or any major issue. Like Peter, it would be easy enough to babble on about building tabernacles the only thing that I know is to see these children of God, this humanity, and to listen. To look and not to look away. To see here change, to see the before and the after, and to listen for the call of the afters after. What might grow? We are called to change and to be changed, beloved. But first we are called to listen. We will be called on to suffer, to die, and to rise with Christ. But first we are called to bear witness, to risk and be vulnerable and filled with compassion, to know our own changes and losses and the holes in our hearts and to let God make of them fertile fields ready for planting. We are called to wait in eager longing for the new things that God is doing in the places of sorrow. This is our duty, right, and joy to face tragedy and sorrow with changed hearts wide open. Amen.